Hello, friends. I am really sad that we are not able to meet and hear each other's papers in person, but I'm also really grateful to Kasha for finding this other way to bring us together nonetheless. From the mid 19th century on, the retelling of classical myths for child audiences has been shaped by romantic conceptions of children as especially attuned to both the imagination and the natural world. Adapters of ancient myths have drawn especially on antiquity's rich legacy of myths about the transformation of humans into plants and animals to present their child readers with a transformed vision of their own surroundings, one in which natural features are animated by unseen spirits and serve as ongoing testimony to mythical events. Such myths allow these writers to connect with child audiences through that presumed attunement to nature and to make stories that derive from a distant culture and an alien religion, and that often give disturbing accounts of human behavior, to make those myths familiar, secular, and more wholesome. For a somewhat old fashioned expression of that agenda, we can turn to a long forgotten work of 1919, Francis Jenkins Olcott's The Wonder Garden, Nature Myths and Tales from All the World Over. When stripped of their repellent elements, for all mythologies, classical and otherwise, contain such elements, these tales are most delightful and fanciful and invest flowers, buds, and nature as a whole with poetic charm that pleases children as does a fairy tale. Retold myths often include an explicit link between their fantastic narratives and visible features of the child's own world. <clears throat> Thus, versions for children of the Arachne myth, which Deborah Roberts and I have explored in a recent essay, often end by pointing out that Arachne is still quietly present in the spiders of the present day. And this is often reinforced by an illustration, as in this example from Lucy Coates's Atticus, the Storyteller's 100 Greek Myths. And ever since then, she has been weaving and weaving and weaving. And here's another from Helen Beckwith's early reader in Mythland, which ends by appealing to the child's own experience. When you see her work, you say, oh, see the spider's web. At the very outset of the Anglophone tradition of classical myths for children, we find the American author, Nathaniel Hawthorne, performing this kind of relocation in an especially pointed way. In his pioneering A Wonder Book from 1851, the modern children who are introduced to classical myths are simultaneously exploring an idyllic landscape in Western Massachusetts. And Hawthorne's internal narrator, Eustace Bright, assertively defends his specifically North American retellings of classical myths, insisting that an old Greek had no more right to them than a modern Yankee does. The classical myths and the New England setting are explicitly linked when Bright suggests a mythical origin for the exceptional vividness of autumn leaves in that particular region, which is in fact a notable natural wonder and the focus of much ongoing tourism. Did I not tell you that old King Midas came to America and changed dusky autumn such as it is in other countries, into the burnished beauty which it here puts on. Another episode of the Midas myth, the often told story of how Midas's barber revealed the secret that Midas had acquired ass's ears to a riverbank, where it was taken up and perpetually retold by rustling reeds, locates a myth in the landscape in a different way, as a marvelous circumstance actively announced by natural phenomena. So in that version of that story by Geraldine McCochran, <clears throat> we learn that when the wind blew, they rustled. When the wind blew harder, they whispered, King Midas has long ass's ears. And on some windy days, the reeds sang so loudly that everyone heard them for miles around. King Midas has long ass's ears. And that is how King Midas's secret is known to us all today. <clears throat> 
The very telling of the myth is detached from its classical source and relocated in the immediate natural world. In this version, that relocation is reinforced through an illustration by Emma Chichester Clark, nothing other than a patch of cattails, a species of reed that would be familiar to the Anglophone and primarily British readers of that book. We see Hawthorne's naturalization of mythical events reconceived and combined with the naturalization of myth telling by the English illustrator, Arthur Rackham, who in his 1922 issue, uh, edition of A Wonder Book expands Hawthorne's terrain to include his own Northern European and British milieu. In the frontispiece to that edition, Rackham plays on Hawthorne's name to present the Hawthorne tree as the source of the myths contained in the book to be accessed by mo the modern children positioned beside it. This particular kind of tree, which evokes the thick forests of Northern European fairy tales, occurs throughout Rackham's work and is a kind of signature of his personal style. So his transformation of Hawthorne into the Hawthorne tree is partly a gesture of appropriation in an edition in which Rackham's illustrations compete with Hawthorne's narratives for importance. But it's also a foretaste of the natural transformations that the text will include. Here, for example, is Rackham's illustration of the Baucus and Philemon myth, in which the devoted and hospitable old couple are turned into intertwined trees. Most myths of natural transformation are not, of course, as free of those repellent elements, to use Alcott's phrase, as that of Bacchus and Philemon, in which turning into a tree constitutes a reward that perpetuates a blameless existence. More often, as the main classical source of such stories, as in the main classical source of such stories, of its metamorphoses, Transformation is an expression of divine anger, as in the case of Arachne, or a form of rescue from pressing danger, as in the case of Daphne, the myth to which I will turn for the rest of this paper. The Daphne myth is frequently included in children's myth collections, even though in its original form, it is the story of an attempted rape that is only narrowly escaped and that ends in ongoing possession. Apollo and Daphne are set in motion as pursuer and pursued when Cupid takes revenge on Apollo by shooting him with an arrow that awakens desire and Daphne with an arrow that makes her resistant to desire. When Daphne's father answers her mid-flight prayer and turns her into a laurel tree, Apollo still forces himself on her. And still Apollo loved her. On the trunk, he placed his hand and felt beneath the bark, her heart still beating, held in his embrace, her branches pressed his kisses on the wood. And when frustrated in his immediate desire, he lays claim to her laurel leaves as his permanent emblem, her trembling branches appear to assent. The presence of that barely evaded sexual conquest is equally strong in the most influential visual representation of this myth, the famous sculpture by Bernini, where Apollo's arm encircles Daphne's still human body and the poses of the two figures echo and complement each other as if they are collaborating in a dance. The influence of Bernini's composition is evident in a number of early to mid 20th century myth collections, including some that while written for children, have illustrations that are not notably child-oriented and mostly follow Ovid's text fairly closely in their narratives. Several versions open up the space between Apollo and Daphne, but give the same impression that he is approaching her in order to initiate a pas de deux, as in this image by Troy Howell for Mary Pope Osborne's favorite Greek myths of 1989, or in this very stylized version by Helen Sewell from 1942. This illustration by James Barry from a 1965 Treasury of Greek Mythology by Alison Whitting 
has the jaunty cartoonish style that so often signals an intended audience of children. And Daphne here has a distinctly unhappy expression. Yet that expression is itself echoed by Apollo and the impression of an incipient dance is still clearly present. An interesting departure from that presentation is this illustration by Oren Sherman from Joan D. Vinge's Random House Book of Greek Myths from 1999. Here, Daphne's transformation seems to be a private experience of spiritual self-realization from which the sober Apollo, who is very much in the background, is excluded. Some illustrators foreclose any ongoing entanglement of the Daphne and Apollo by presenting Daphne by herself, as in this version by Margaret Evans Price from 1924, which is clearly influenced by Rackham. Here, Daphne's merging with the tree suggests not a narrow escape in mid-flight, but the ongoing presence of a spirit within a natural feature, much like those of Bacchus and Philemon, in Rackham's illustration. I now turn to a few examples of the Daphne myth that are more overtly oriented to their child audience, both in their style of illustration and in their adaptation of Ovid, and that draw on the natural world as the special domain of children as a way of dealing with the repellent elements of the myth. My first example comes from the still widely read Dolaire's Book of Greek Myths from 1962. The Dolaire's Daphne is something of a caricature, a stubborn figure whose resistance to Apollo is not entirely sympathetic. She has a cold heart and has vowed never to marry. She would rather be an unmoving tree than the bride of the great god Apollo. But their version of the story also responds to the serious concerns that the myth raises by undoing any impression that Apollo is still somehow having his way. In the second of their sequential illustrations, they have revised the familiar Bernini-derived composition. The initial chase results in a standoff so that Daphne's pose no longer chimes with Apollo's pursuit. Rather, he is stymied and apart arrested in mid attempted embrace. Daphne's triumph is expressed in the thick, scratchy looking bark that Apollo is not touching and wouldn't want to, which is both evocative of real life bark and quite different from the smooth and slender trunk of an actual laurel tree. In the Dolaire's text, Apollo no longer feels, but only hears Daphne's still beating heart and his appropriation of the laurel is restrained. Apollo carefully broke off some twigs and made a wreath of the shining leaves. Meanwhile, in the background of their illustration, the parallel myth of Pan's pursuit of Syrinx is similarly resolved with a lustful god left on his own, surrounded by a clump of leaves, a clump, I'm sorry, a clump of reeds. Lucy Coates's Atticus, the Storyteller's 100 Greek Myths from 2002 goes yet further in adapting the story for a child audience with a less distanced perspective on Daphne's experience. Coates's Daphne is an anxious adolescent whose connection to nature allows her to linger in childhood, protected from dangers posed by the adult world. While her river godfather is off gathering a cattail bouquet for her, Daphne, busy washing her hair, is treated with protective concern by other elements of the natural world, which give voice to her all too legitimate worries. The air was calm and still, and it was a beautiful summer's morning, but the swifts seemed to be calling, danger, danger, as they screamed and wheeled across the sky. And even the clouds of midges seemed to be buzzing a warning. The cause of this danger becomes clear when a stranger suddenly appears and dazzles her with jewels and his own blinding light. Then as she shrinks back and covers her eyes, 
Apollo grabbed her around the waist and threw her over his shoulder laughing. He began to run into the woods. Daphne's resistance to Apollo is not due to the cold heart ascribed to her by the Dolaires or to the anti-erotic arrow sent by Cupid that features in Ovid's version, but rather to legitimate terror at being abducted. And her salvation is initiated by her own efforts. Daphne screamed as she felt thorns and twigs catching her long hair, and she kicked Apollo as hard as she could and bit his hand so that he dropped her with a cry of surprise. Once reconnected with the ground, Daphne cries out to Mother Earth, who roots her there. Daphne felt her feet slow down, and as she watched, her toes sprouted roots. Her legs became smooth green bark, and her arms and head became branches. The hair on her head grew flat and smooth and pointed and attached itself to the twigs sprouting out of her head. A wonderful, warm smell of spice came from the leaves. Daphne had turned into a bay tree. Here, mythic transformation is presented to child readers as a welcome form of arrested development, a refuge from the perilous world of adult sexuality, rooted in nature, but also suggestive of a kitchen suffused with the comforting smell of baking. There's a subtle allusion here to the ongoing use of the bay leaf in cooking as a feature of a child's familiar world, reminiscent of references to the spider in versions of the Arachne myth. This version does not end as most, most others do with an etiological conclusion about the laurel wreath as a mark of glorious achievement. Uh, just to give one example, and ever afterwards, not just in ancient Greece, but even today, the laurel wreath has been a symbol of the poet and the victor. That's from Alison Whitting. Here, the rightness of Daphne's brave resistance and the wrongness of the stranger's assault are confirmed in Apollo's chastened reaction. Apollo was sorry for what he had done and always wore a crown of bay leaves afterwards so that he would never forget Daphne. The triumphant appropriation of the laurel in the original myth has become a sign of penitence. In the accompanying illustration by, oops, in the accompanying illustration by Anthony Lewis, Apollo is significantly diminished and a self-doubting figure, stopped in his tracks far behind Daphne rather than further pressing his unwelcome suit. Daphne remains gripped by fear as the whole of her developing body is encased in protective bark. In Geraldine McCochran's 1992 version, Daphne's transformation involves a return to childhood of a different kind. McCochran neatly conflates Daphne's transformation into a tree with the vigorous resistance displayed in Coates's version. Daphne's father answers her call just as Apollo is putting his hands on her. Got you, cried Apollo triumphantly, catching hold of both her arms. But suddenly his hands were full of splinters. Ahead of him, Daphne stopped so suddenly that he bloodied his nose and scraped his shins against bark. Apollo has been put in his place by a transformation of his own from overconfident divine suitor to a boy bearing the marks of vigorous outdoor play, splinters, a bloody nose, scratched up legs. He could be one of the children who roam the countryside in Hawthorne's Wonder Book when they are not listening to Greek myths. The illustration by Emma Chichester Clark provides an unusual, fully naturalized version of the laurel tree with Dap Daphne completely integrated into the landscape as in the same illustrator's image of the reeds that gossip about Midas. Meanwhile, Apollo's possession of the laurel is not made less aggressive as in the Dolaires and Lucy Coates versions, since this Apollo does not learn his lesson. Before running off in search of a more friendly woman, he pompously declares that the tree will be sacred to him 
Let every victorious hero returning from wars, every emperor and king be crowned with a wreath of bay leaves because Apollo's first love was the green bay tree. But he does this without Daphne's agreement. The river had turned her into a green bay tree and there she stood trembling, but only because of the breeze. And in keeping with the author's gently mocking tone, the illustrator has undermined Apollo by appropriating those bay leaves as decorative elements encircling the page, less reminiscent of a victor's crown than of the useful, familiar present day cooking spice. This illustration with its wholly natural tree subtly adjust, adjusts the illustration that precedes it on the page before. There, the warring protagonists of the story Cupid, Apollo, and Daphne are glumly stationed in a clearly Mediterranean setting with cypresses and palm trees. But afterwards, as their conflicts are resolved, Daphne is safely transformed and Apollo is still on the move, destined to exit the picture frame, leaving behind only branching deciduous trees such as might be found in the present day environments of English speaking children. Whatever dangers the Greek myth carries have been neutralized as its elements are absorbed into the child-friendly realm of nature. All that will remain is an enchanting tale known to those who can discern the secret lives of ordinary plants and animals. Thank you. <laughs>